Gracias, uh, profesor. So um, it's great to be here, and uh, much appreciation to the Foxes for building this place. Not just this event, but I think that Mexico and Guanajuato are blessed to have an organization like this. So here's what we're going to do. The, the topic we're going to address is the fact that today is the slowest pace of change we will experience the rest of our lives. Now think about that for a second. This is not just hyperbole, this is real. The data are quite clear. Competition is harder today than it was 10 years ago or 20 years ago. Competition across industries is accelerating and intensifying. So how do we think about this? How do we develop foresight to where the world might go? And then insight, what that means for us as a business, as an institution. And then how do we act? What do we actually do? Now, we can't cover this all in 45 minutes. But what we're going to do is I'm going to give a frame for our conversation for about 20 minutes about where the world might be going in the next 20 years. Thinking forward from the things we're seeing today, are there some signposts to where things might go in the future? And second, I have the privilege of introducing later my good friend and colleague from Japan, Kono-sensei, who is also, in addition to being a faculty member at an institution in Japan, he's also the co-founder and president of the Japan Innovation Network. So to give you an idea of if we could go to my slides, as opposed to at the beginning, uh, <laughs> at the beginning of the presentation, um, if we could go to the first slide, from my presentation. So we together, Kano Sensei and I, have a global network called the Kellogg Innovation Network. It's a group of innovation and growth leaders from around the world. We're from all six continents. Uh, we gather a few times a year to talk about our problems and see how the world might change in the future. This is the frontispiece for the event we just had in Miami Beach earlier this year. And President Fox was one of our participants and keynote speakers, and we're great, grateful for that. But the reason we have the kin, the reason we bring people from all six continents in business, government, nonprofit, the arts, academia, defense, is because if we always look in the same places, we're liable to find the same answers. Think about your own career. You enter a company in an industry. You get to know everything about the company. You get to know everything about the industry, the suppliers, the customers, the competitors. You get to go out to know almost nothing about any other industry. I have a secret for you. Your competitors already know everything you're doing. Well, and of course, you already know everything they're doing as well. You're going to the same conferences. You read the same publications. You hire the same people. In some places, that's called incest. But you know, I guess it works in business. So we've got to get beyond that. We've got to reach out to other sectors, other industries, other geographies. That's one of the reasons I'm here, one of the reasons my colleagues from around the world are here, because we're interested in learning what you're doing here in Mexico and understanding what we can transfer and translate back into our environment. That's where innovation happens. And in fact, it's one space that few people pay attention to, finding things somewhere else in the world in another industry, in another geography, another function that works, that people are making money doing, and then translating it into your industry or your geography. This is a skill none of us have been trained for. And so if you do it well as a company, you will have a distinct advantage. So I'll back up now and to the topic that I set up earlier, which was where might the world go in the next 20 years? Now, you've all heard of all of these technologies on the screen. People are talking about them all the time, but interestingly, as far as I can tell, very few people have recognized a common underlying dynamic that they drive in the marketplace. All of these technologies, while very different, drive a common underlying dynamic that's changing every industry. And that is based on the fact that each of these technologies pushes data sensing knowledge, access to resources, knowledge about resources, the ability to produce things, to do things, the ability to make decisions, further and further out into the economy at smaller and smaller spaces and levels in the economy, more and more granular. And what does this mean? 
What does this do to our industries? It pushes, and this is the key point, the production and provision of products and services ever closer to the moment of demand. Let me say that again. All of these technologies you're hearing about, distributed energy generation like rooftop solar, we heard from Solar City yesterday, 3D printing, Uber, crowdfunding, all of these technologies allow us to push the production and provision of products and services ever closer to the moment where someone might demand it. I'll give you an example of this that's happening right now. This is the company Amazon, everybody's favorite company, Amazon. They do something called anticipatory shipping. Now, it's brilliant, but also a little bit creepy. Anticipatory shipping says that Amazon is sending products to distribution centers near you before you've even ordered the product. Now, I'm not just talking about demand planning or anything like that. I'm talking about they're paying attention to your online behaviors. You individually, they're watching what you're clicking on, where you're sitting when you're watching, what you're clicking through. And then there's a wonderful thing they call cursor hover time. This, this is when there's a product you really want to buy, but your wife said you shouldn't, but you really want to, and you, and you keep looking at it, and maybe eventually you will buy it. We call this digital drooling. So the cursor is running over the product that you haven't bought. They're watching that, and they're sending the products to distribution centers before you've ordered the product. This will increase markedly over the next 20 years. And let me give you an idea from another realm. It's digital manufacturing, which is quite important to Mexico. We have today a global supply chain optimized for scale manufacturing at a distance. Think about this. A supply chain globally optimized for scale manufacturing at a distance. That means the larger the plant, the lower the cost. That's generally true. Not always, but generally true. With 3D printing, over the next 20 to 30 years, I'm not talking about the next two or three years. I'm talking of which will happen gradually. 3D printing will enter into the market at the edges, at the periphery, just like Clayton Christensen said yesterday. It happens at the bottom. It comes at the edges. It's not very good at first, but then it gets better and better and starts to incur into core markets. I'll give you an example. Today, if you want to buy one fork, you really can't. You need to go to a store and buy 12 forks. From where did those 12 forks come? Well, someone in Western Australia mined iron ore, put it on a ship, sent it to China, melted it down, created steel, alloyed it into stainless, sent that to another plant, made 12 forks, put them in a box, onto a pallet, into a ship. The ship went to the port of Long Beach. Well, they're on strike, probably went to a different port, then went to a crate and barrel store, and then I bought 12 forks. Today... It is technologically trivial, it is very easy, if you have the equipment, to download a file, push a button, and produce one fork. Think about what this will mean in each of your industries moving forward. Now, this is not new. This is not brand new. This has been happening for a long time. Think about the fact that people want what they want, when they want, where they want it. That's natural. The problem was not that we didn't want to do this in the past. The problem was that we couldn't. We didn't have the technology. Back in the 1960s and 70s, the Japanese adopted just-in-time manufacturing. Many of you are familiar with this. Let's have just enough inventory in our manufacturing plant to hit our service levels, but not more, because if we have too much inventory, we waste money higher working capital. This was a revolution in manufacturing, and this was a manifestation of having what I need, when I need, where I need it. The reason we didn't go further was not because we didn't want to, it's because we couldn't. Furthermore, you might remember these fellows, Steve and Steve, they founded Apple. This is a picture of them with the first Apple product that they developed. By the way, the first technology that the Steve and Steve developed was a technology to steal long-distance phone calls. 
they were actually committing felonies in their first uh, tour of duty, but they saw the light and built what we know of today as Apple. Now, note that in the 1970s, a personal computer was simply a hobbyist toy. No one serious took them seriously. I was in elementary school at the time, and my parents bought me a TRS-80. I don't know if any of you remember that. This was a really horrible computer from Radio Shack. By the way, who buys a computer at a shack? But in any case, it was called the TRS-80. We called it the Trash-80. It was an affectionate term for the computer. Why? Because it couldn't do anything. The only thing this computer did is it had a blinking cursor. There was nothing else you could do with the computer. But we loved it. It was a hobbyist toy. But then the hobbyists around the world, like Steve and Steve, started to move forward. And then IBM, in the early 80s, launched the PC. And everything changed. 3D printing is in exactly the same place today. For the past decade, hobbyists have been going to maker fairs around the world to share the cool things that they're doing. And business, for a long time, wasn't paying much attention. Today they are. Rolls-Royce and General Electric both 3D print metal parts for aircraft engines. It's coming. Now note that true breakthroughs will not happen by doing a little better what we already do. Our natural inclination is to look at a new technology and say, oh, what can we use this for to improve the things we currently do in our processes? That's a good exercise, but it's not enough. And most of us stop with that. What we need to do is ask, what are the things we can do today that we could have never done before? Last year, I was at Lockheed Martin Missiles and Fire Control, and I was meeting with the engineer at Lockheed, who's in charge of tracking 3D printing developments. And he showed me a part. It was a metal part sliced in half. So you could see the, the, the center of this part. It was a lattice work of metal. He said, this part has the strength of steel and the weight of aluminum. The strength of steel and the weight of aluminum. And before 3D printing, it was impossible to create this part. That's what we're looking for. Now, longer term, I want you to think out about this. We all know about self-driving cars. Our colleague from Nissan shared tomorrow how quickly self-driving vehicles are coming. I will make a prediction today, and that is somewhere in the next 10 to 20 years, I don't know when, but somewhere in the next 20 years, the public dialogue about self-driving cars will move from should we allow self-driving cars on the road to should we allow human drivers on the road? I can tell you who's going to win. Now, this means at some point in the next 20, it could be 25 years. That's not my point. Sometime in the next 25 years, all taxi and limo driver jobs in the United States, developed countries in Mexico, will be eliminated. In the United States last year, we had 250,000 taxi and limo drivers, according to the Bureau of Labor Statistics, not including Uber drivers. All of those jobs will be gone. How do we organize and cope as a society, and what do we do as businesses? Last year, I was speaking at the, the Frankfurt Auto Show in September. There was a new program called New Mobility World. It was an entire floor of the show, the first time they've ever done it, dedicated to non-core automotive technologies. So electric vehicles, self-driving vehicles, telematics, all these things we're hearing about today. And as part of this program, I was also interviewing people and moderating panels. So I had the opportunity to have conversation in advance with some of the panelists. One of the speakers was Carlos Tavares. Carlos is the chairman of Peugeot Citroën, the large French automaker. And I was impressed by how deeply he had been thinking about these issues. Carlos shared with me that three years ago, so that would be four years ago now, no one in the global automotive industry was paying any attention at all to self-driving vehicles. There were little pockets here and there, but that's it. No one was listening. 
He said, today we are all scrambling to try and figure out how to cope and how to thrive in the long run. Let's assume, he said, that the self-driving car works because we think it will. 10 years, 20 years from now, we have it distributed across the economy. Today, a family that needs two, maybe three cars in the future might only need one car. Now, they might need no cars because they use ride sharing, but let's set that aside to make our math easy. That family that today needs two or three cars might only have one car. Why? Because that one car can drive one spouse to work, then dro drop the kids off at school, drive the other spouse to work, take another spouse on errands. That's a, it's a weird family, but it, you know, it's a modern family. So you get the idea. Now, Carlos pointed out this is very interesting and incredibly scary. Why? Because for the entire history of the global automotive industry, we've used one metric to determine who's succeeding and who's failing, and that metric is unit sales. The entire industry has organized itself since its founding around a metric called unit sales, and in the next 20 to 25 years, that metric will be destroyed. Now, Carlos said there is hope. Number one, we can't wait. We have to start experimenting today and understand how our core metrics affect our decisions and experiment with new metrics. Number two, that car the family bought now has what we call higher asset utilization meaning the car is driving around more. What does that drive? That drives higher service requirements and replacement parts. And it turns out that people make more money on service and replacement parts than they do on the original vehicle. So there is hope, but we have to start now. I'll give you another quick example. Blockchain. Don't need to explain what it is today. Look it up if you're not familiar with it. It's the technology methodology underlying Bitcoin but it can be used for many other things. Essentially, it is just a distributed trust engine with no third party. Now, what is insurance? The entire insurance industry is a third party trust engine. What I am not saying is that blockchain will replace the global insurance industry in the next three or four years. I am not suggesting that, but what I am saying is, if you're in any industry that requires trust for contracts, transactions, insurance, anything like this, you need to be paying attention because these technologies are coming at the edges. And as I said before, the wrong decision is to look at the technology and say, how can this affect the center of my business now? Because usually your answer is, it probably won't. Usually your answer is, it's not going to affect my core business right now. Instead, ask questions like, what fringe applications might be relevant for this technology? What customer needs do I have that are on the edges that I might try to experiment with? How can, and this is essential, how can I know more about the periphery of my business than anyone else? And finally, one that most companies overlook, how can I be prepared when a disaster happens? Because with truly new technologies, something will go wrong. Things will happen. And when that happens, I need to be ready. The military calls this a war game. It's a scenario plan. So I'm going to share one story and then uh, turn the floor over to my, my friend and colleague, Kano Sensei. And that is about predicting the future. This is related to electric vehicles. So for 120 years, electric vehicles have not happened. So therefore, everyone in the global auto industry for many years ignored electric vehicles. In fact, for a long time, everyone assumed that Tesla would go out of business. Back in 2009 and 10, my firm Clario was working with Castrol, the oil company, the lubricants company. They were asking us, where might the world be in 15 or 20 years, and how do we prepare? And it's important to note that electric vehicles take no engine oil. Electric vehicles take no engine oil at all, and so you'd think that all global engine oil companies would be concerned about this. None of them were. We know because we checked. 
Now, one of the things this, their CEO wanted us to explore and change the mindset of the leadership of the company was to overcome this bias against electric vehicles. And it was a reasonable bias because it had never worked. Now, in order to do this, we took the leadership team to a variety of locations around the world, Bangalore, Singapore, London, Silicon Valley. And in Silicon Valley, our opening speaker for these working sessions, there were half castral people and half external people, you need to bring the outside in, was Steve Jurvetson. Steve is one of the top venture capitalists in the world and the lead investor in Tesla. Remember, this was 2010. Most people thought Tesla was going to go out of business. So these next slides are Steve's slides. Steve got up and said to the team at Castrol, hi, I'm here to put you out of business. And they laughed, and he laughed, and he said, but I'm actually kind of serious. So what is the main reason people do not buy electric vehicles? What is the number one reason people do not buy electric vehicles other than price? Range. We even have a word for it, range anxiety. People are worried they're going to be driving through the Mojave Desert, and they'll run out of charge, and they'll die a horrible death. So what do they think? They think, I have to wait until there's a whole infrastructure of charging stations all over the country ready for my electric vehicle. How many of you have a garage in your house? How many of you might have a garage? So if you don't, you might ask your boss, maybe you need a raise, okay? You have a garage, right? Can you plug stuff in in your garage? Huh. Can you fill up your petrol-based car in your garage? No. And here's the kicker. This vehicle, or vehicles like them, by somewhere between 2022 and 2026, will get 1,000 miles on one charge. 1,000 miles on one charge. Now, who cares about charging stations? I will tell you that there are today many organizations spending hundreds of millions of dollars to invest in charging station companies. They will almost all lose their money. Why? Because we take the new thing and we cram it into the old paradigm. We do it over and over again. In 2010, all of these vehicles were all electric vehicles for sale in China. Six years ago. I wouldn't want to be caught dead in any of them because you probably would be caught dead in them. They, they weren't very safe. But will some of them get better? and eventually rise and incur into core markets, absolutely. And so Mike Johnson, the CEO of Castrol, after this session, took his leadership team aside. This was not our idea, it was his, and said, how will we make money in the future if no one needs lubricants? Now, what he was not saying was, we're going to be out of business in three years. He, he's too smart to believe something silly like that. But what he was saying instead was, we need to start preparing our opportunities for the future before the future happens. So we help them develop a range of opportunity areas which they're currently investing in. We help them design Castrol InnoVentures, launched it, and they're investing in four of these opportunity areas. And in interest of time, I'll get to some summary points. Number one, customers don't care about your constraints. How many times have you been in meetings where you're talking about a new opportunity or a new concept and everybody in the company is talking about why we can't do it? How the industry isn't structured like that? The government won't let us. We have never done it like that before. The fact is your customers just don't care. Second, always consider new metrics for success, to make sure the metrics you're following are the right ones. Pay close attention to the peripheries. Again, peripheries are the edges of your industry, the stuff that's just outside, that hasn't quite moved in yet. Pay attention early so you can be ready. And interestingly, collaboration, as competition becomes more intense, counterintuitively, collaboration becomes more important. In the technology industry, we have a word called freemium. Now, people in other industries hear this uh, freemium, uh, frenemy. 
people in other industries hear the word frenemy and they sort of laugh and say, oh, I get it, a friend and an enemy. Uh, very funny. But in the technology industry, it's not funny. It's real. There are large corporations who are both partnering together and making a lot of money together, and at the same time, they are bitter, bitter rivals. We cannot afford to be Pepsi and Coke. We cannot afford anymore to see the world as us and them. Human beings are motivated by a sense of mission and purpose. Money is important, but it's of secondary importance once you pass a certain level. They're motivated by a sense that they're doing something meaningful, they're contributing. Human beings grow through challenges. We do not grow when everything's going great. I wish this were not the case, but I know it is the case for me. I grow when I'm facing adversity, when the chips are down, when we have to rise to the occasion, not when everything is going great. So the role of a leader is to identify the challenges and pose them to our teams, to our people, before the marketplace does it to us. Because in a competitive economy, it will. With that, I have the pleasure of transitioning to my friend and colleague, Nobu Kono. Kono Sensei has been doing some very interesting work in Japan about purpose in business. He's been working with one of the world's leading business academics, Nonaka Sensei, if you're familiar with Nonaka and Takauchi. Uh, and I offer the floor to Kano to share his insights with us. Okay. Thank you, Rob. Buenos dias. Thank you. Uh, <clears throat> thank you. Uh, responding to uh, Rob's the perspective, now economy. I'd like to make a very short presentation. I try not to uh, exceed 10 minutes. But before that, uh, let me explain my little corner. I teach as an MBA professor, but at the same time, I'm running this organization, Japan Innovation Network. We are an accelerator for large firms. We help that they are large Japanese are large Japanese firms to be innovative. And they, uh, many Japanese firms are struggling to adapt to the new environment like uh, Rob just mentioned. Everyone know uh, in this convention conference uh, told me, hey, Japan is an innovative country. No, we don't think so anymore. We have been innovative, like he said, and Professor Christensen said. We were innovative in the 90s, 70s, 80s, and 90s, but we are now struggling. So we are helping the companies. Uh, if I uh, uh, interpret Rob's presentation to my word, we can say that the center of gravity of your innovation shifted from your company or lab to our society or technologically empowered individuals from the end of the society. So it's a shift from supply side innovation to demand side innovation. Yes. That's a huge shift. Why Japanese companies are struggling is this. They deeply rooted in technology supply innovation, not the demand innovation. That's we are on a threat to the disruptive innovation. That's the kind of our uh, background. But uh, before our, I talk about the our purpose, I did uh, some homework. This is Kizania. Do you know Kizania? Yeah, this is a great Mexican invention, innovation. And we have two Kizanias in Japan, and the kids are really, really enjoying it. But uh, that couple data, uh, not mine. See, our, who works the longest? You and I, you and <laughs> Mexican Japan, are hardest working people in the world, okay? Yet, I'm not showing this data, but our labor productivity isn't high. Because in our case, we are heavily rooted in the manufacturing industrial society. The way we work doesn't fit 
to the modern world. That's why trying to do our ministry is trying to change how we work, and they are investing it like a diversity. This is just they are you know, too small, but this is interesting uh, data by Dutch guy Hofstede about countries' characteristics. Mexico and Japan have two common characteristics by his research, which is UAI, Uncertain Avoidance Index, meaning we want to avoid uncertainties. You're listening to new things, but in here, you don't like changes. <laughs> your, guts don't say, your gut says, no, 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 we don't want to change. Yeah? And also masculinity, man, yeah. In Japan, the most masculine, most uncertain avoiding country. Yeah, we are macho, we're samurai. But look at these in you know, the top left, the so-called innovative countries, regions like Scandinavians, totally opposite. Can we, these machos and samurai, become innovative? Yes and no, that's a question. And the answer is the purpose. Uh, today we're talking about innovation and entrepreneurship. Uh, let me explain what's innovation, first of all, because there are so many interpretations of innovation. Uh, this is simple. Entrepreneurs sense changes in society and see the gap and try to change the situation by Inside, by finding discovery, some insights, and try to change it by trial and error or experiment. That's easy, right? Actually, innovation is a social activity, not the technology of things, especially in now economy. But deep inside, what entrepreneurs do is to get new or novel viewpoints, new point of view. This is critical. If you don't, this new point of view, you are not able to combine new technologies. You're not doing innovation. You're just doing math and experiments. That's the kind of our, the, our entrepreneur uh, innovation model. So point is, if you're an entrepreneur, it's okay. We talk about innovation leaders, but individual leadership isn't enough for incumbents like us. Large firms, no. We have to have this kind of a process deep in your organization. You have to create internal innovation ecosystem like this. That's why, by the way, what Japan Innovation does. Hopefully, are not many, but a portion of Japanese companies, large firms, now realize the social changes are the sources of innovation. Like a Hitachi, it's a large company, says social innovation, social innovation. Fujitsu, human-centric innovation. NEC, social value creation. So these guys started to adopt this kind of organizational entrepreneurship. It's not individual, but organizational. Now, uh, then we go to, uh, sorry, uh, purpose, right. I think this the purpose is very, very important issue here. Uh, I said, you have to embed organizational entrepreneurship. We call innovation management. What you need as a large corporation or macho or samurai, you have to embed innovation management in your process. And the purpose is the engine of this innovation management. If you lack purpose, it's just the processes, yeah? Uh, I had a chat with our Professor, uh, Professor Chris Tenson uh, the day before yesterday. In disruptive innovation, disruptors look like destroyers, destroyers to you. But there is no disruptors who really want to destroy you or your industry from the start. They start the innovation 
from the betterment for the customers and society. Eventually, this activity causes some disruptions to your industry, but at the first stage, the purpose is the key. So if you are machos and samurai, please take away the importance of purpose. Of course, purpose is a good thing to have, of course. A lot of research, a lot of research is done on the importance of a purpose. Purpose leads innovation, yes. On the other hand, there are many businesses that cannot express their purposes. They say money and efficiency is purpose, but we know it's not. Customers in our economy and young employees, like millennials, don't buy it. Purpose is particularly important for open innovation as well. By questioning purpose, it compels you to redesign your business model. Uh, I don't have time today, but it's a great common sense that the purpose in management is important. We have to ask Aristotle, but today I skipped it. <laughs> but instead, uh, I'd like to you to read through these quotes. Peter Drucker says the importance of the purpose. John Cale, Mr. Creativity, Institute for Large-Scale Innovation, talks about innovation is about purpose. Elon Musk, yesterday we had our, the, the, the solar city story. Elon Musk's overarching purpose is to create a solar economy. And the corporate, large corporate leaders also understand the importance of purpose. And of course, your political social leaders, Mr. Fox. <laughs> uh, in a nutshell, uh, when we talk about uh, the purpose, uh, there are two parts. Just talking about purpose isn't enough. We have to have a wisdom of managing purposes. Two parts, management on good purpose, or create a good purpose, or judge on a good purpose, on purpose, and all the purposes, because many players have different purposes, so we have to orchestrate. So there are two parts, creating and doing management on good purpose, and management of multiple individual purposes. It looks like this. Three layers. First, start from big purpose. For Tesla Motors, for instance, or overarching purpose, create a solar economy. It's big, huge, but it leads to common good. And we have individual purposes, but it's complex. So we have to have in the middle driving objective or mission, what the robber is talking about, to orchestrate and synthesize these purposes to the betterment and the practice. Why so purpose is important? There's another reason. We talk a lot about innovation, but do nothing. At least, that's the problem of Japanese large firms culture now. Purpose is a thing which puts us into practice. Good purpose compels us to practice, move macho and samurai forward in this disruptive era. We should have this, we should have this wisdom. It's about becoming to be able to do what we got to do in this complex era. Thank you. Great. Thanks. Nobu, if you could join me for a moment. That was great. It, it, you mentioned the Kellogg in, uh, Innovation Network and the Japan Innovation Network earlier. Right. We're, we're partner uh, organizations. Yeah, you're collaborating. Thank you very much. <laughs> Not at all. Well, Can you tell us briefly um, what is the role of the Japan Innovation Network in yeah. Japan? Okay. Because it's actually, it's been around, what, five years? Mm -hmm. 
And it's, uh, I have to tell you, it's an immensely successful organization. Oh. It has engaged government, private sector. Okay. Yeah. You have how many member companies in this group? Okay, oh, before that, let me explain briefly uh, what we are, because that's important. Uh, we are started this Japan Innovation Network. This is a non-profit organization based on the METI's project for three years. METI okay. is the Ministry of Economic Trade and Industry for three years on innovation talents. Yeah. And they, after that, they find that the, the uh, research program ended, the ministry said, thank you. We said, no, 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 no. This innovation, you have to put in practice. Right. They said, we in ministry, are we not doing it? Mm -hmm. So instead, we will do it. So we started the, the, this innovation uh, thing. And what we do is to promote largely, uh, I mean, large Japanese firms to innovate by helping them to build internal ecosystem, which is innovation management process, right. by supplying the thinking tools, uh, programs, etc. Right. And our purpose is to make Japan innovation nation, but not just make Japan great. <laughs> Uh, we try to be uh, innovative for the world. Right. Because uh, innovation with such a social cause, like the Japanese companies we showed, that's good for the world. Yeah. So we're helping them. But what's, what it's, it's interesting about uh, your comments and also Clay Christensen's yesterday is mm -hmm. Japan was one of the most successful countries on the we planet. Were. Right. And you still have great companies, great technology, right. great people but the ability to marshal them to do truly new things. Yeah. And mm -hmm. so what the JIN, the Japan mm -hmm. Innovation Network, is doing is working with them to say, continue to be great at what you're great at, mm -hmm. but you also need another tier. Right. You need an approach to building the future, creating new things, and the two need to be connected properly. Mm -hmm. That is a, an extraordinary Thank mission and mm -hmm. purpose, right. Nobu, and we're coming up to the end. Uh, but to conclude, I'd like to ask everyone to reflect on the notion of purpose in business. And to do so, I'll share a quick story about my own journey. Back uh, when I was young and knew everything, uh, I believed in the maxim generated by Milton Friedman and many others in the economic sphere, that the one and only one social responsibility of business was to maximize profits mm -hmm. within the rules of the game. This is the notion of maximizing share owner value as the number one objective of business. In my 20s, I believed that. I saw the theory. I recognized that the theory worked. It made brilliant sense. It was elegant. It was beautiful. And it wasn't just saying that you would maximize profits to make more money. Not just that. It was saying that by focusing all your efforts as a business on maximizing your performance, if all other businesses were doing this as well, in the aggregate, we would all be more prosperous. This was the argument of Friedman. It was not that, screw the world, we're just going to make profits. It was we would all rise together. My doctoral advisor, who is my mentor, Don Fry. Don Fry was the designer of the original Ford Mustang. He was CEO of Bell & Howell, which for many years was a Fortune 500 company. He was a very serious, wonderful, insightful gentleman. He told me, I don't buy it. I don't agree. Maximizing share owner value is not the number one objective of business. Mm -hmm. And we argued. And I respectfully disagreed with him and said, you can believe whatever you want, but I don't agree. And here's why. He said the theory, which is beautiful, it works in theory, but it doesn't work in practice. In theory, it works in theory, but in practice, it doesn't. Because he said that having as your number one objective to maximize profitability can lead you astray. It can cause you to make short-term decisions, even if you should be making long-term decisions in the moment that drive you down the wrong path. And I said, but if you make those wrong decisions in the near term, you are not maximizing share owner value in the long run. Therefore, you are violating Milton Friedman's assertion. And he said, yes, I know. 
But remember, in theory, it works in practice. In practice, it doesn't. And then later, I realized Don was right. Enron happened. Hmm. You remember Enron? One of the most innovative companies in the world, by the way. They've created parts of the energy markets that had never existed before that still exist today. A wonderful company, but a company that was led astray. And here's what happened. Back in the 60s when they were founded, their predecessor company, people did not show up and say, let's go be horrible people and just make as much money as possible. That is not what happened. They were a good company. They grew over many years. And then the culture started to change. New leadership came in. And the new leaders said, you will, maximize, you will hit your numbers every quarter, and that is the number one priority. And anyone who didn't hit the numbers failed or was fired. Anyone who did hit the numbers rose up and made more money. And guess what everyone wanted to do? Well, that's a good thing, except when you run against that first quarter when you're not going to quite hit your numbers. And then someone says, you know what, in the accounting department maybe, or finance, or who knows where, someone says there's this little accounting trick we can do to solve the problem. It's totally legal. I don't know if it's ethical, but it's totally legal and will probably never get caught. Great, let's do it. It's very small. And then another quarter comes along, and we are missing our numbers. And someone says, well, we did that little thing before. Here's another thing we can do to hit our numbers. And it's a little bit more bad, but not too bad. And the law, legal department said, we probably won't get caught, so it's OK. And then years later, we're doing things that we would never have thought about doing at the beginning because they're unethical and they're illegal. Why? Because the desire, the drive, the passion to always hit our numbers at all costs led us astray. So as President Fox told us at the Kellogg Innovation Network Global Summit, as Nobu just told us here, the purpose of business is purpose. Find that purpose, what we are trying to change in the world. Thank you very much, thank Nobu. Thank you very much. And thank, thank you. you very much.